um, we've been talking about the presence of God, and Pastor Jay has been talking about um, these last few weeks about the manifest presence, um, the um, omnipresence of God and the abiding presence of God. And so as we're in that whole, in that whole series kind of, of, of his presence, um, he realized, he said last week, he said, um, I kind of touched on give God a year, but he got to it way too late. And so um, I just, as I was praying, there's something that the Lord's been stirring in me. And so I'm going to talk about that next week. But then I felt like the Lord just said, let's talk about this whole give me a year. What does that even mean? And so um, why give God a year? If you look under some of your seats, there is, um, I thought I brought up my props. There is, David, could I have your right under yours. Under some of your seats, we kind of did every, every other chair. If you were not here with us, um, there was, thank you, um, these bookmarks that we made. And these bookmarks are actually for you. And it says, give God a year. Give God a year is about intentionally being present, allowing him to establish his plan and purpose in us, aligning our hearts so his spirit can move without hindrance. As Jay and I were prepping for what does the Lord want to do kind of in 2016, um, not necessarily just confined to the to the calendar year, not just confined to if you were here last week and this week, then your year starts like then, and then like it expires in exactly a year. Um, where we're using, it's, it's not like that. Give God a year is really about an intentional pursuit of God. Now, for those of you who are married, you could probably agree that if you didn't intentionally pursue your spouse, what would happen? Right. If we didn't intentionally pursue our kids with um, with with guidelines and, and instruction and and time and um, whether it's going on dates, we'd like to go on dates with our kids, go on dates with our kids, give them presents. If we didn't do that and we just kind of left them to just be. Oh, goodness gracious. I love my children. My, my youngest was Jay goes, turn, everyone give everyone a high five. And my youngest is like running through the aisles, just slapping people high fives. Like he's just putting his, his hand out like, who's going to give me a high five? If I let that child just to himself, it would be filled with many games, lots of Doritos, lots of popsicles. I mean, could you imagine if we just left things to be like, well, he's a person. He knows what to do. No. And our relationship with God is we could just say, hey, God is God. He's going to do what he wants to do. He has his will. That's actually false. I find myself that late. I was at a conference this weekend and, and someone said something and I thought, I, I said it, I think kind of loud. I said, oh, that's not true. Because we, we kind of we kind of begin to believe these theologies of our experiences. If it's God's will, it's going to happen. Right. Oh, God must have allowed that to happen. No, 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 no. There's the, these false doctrines that, which part of it is we want to bring comfort to ourselves. There's oftentimes that situations happen that we don't have answers for. But the truth and the reality is it's not God's will all the time. The truth and the, the reality is God has a plan and a purpose for you, but that may not just happen because he wants it to happen. Yeah, he's God. Yeah, he's the creator of everything. That's 100% true. But he's a, he's a loving God that has in, in, in given us free will. And that's something to be... Um, to embrace and pursue because then we get to pursue him. And so give God a year is not just about, it, it, there is something intentional the Lord wants us to pursue. Giving him a, a year is about a pursuit of him, not just in theory, not just when I have time, but being intentional in doing and living. Um, at the end of the at the end of Jesus's time on earth, he was after he was resurrected. So we're like seven days in of him. If we look at the timeline, we kind of we'll do you know you do your season up to when he died, and then you know Easter's that kind of big celebration. Like yes, he's risen. But then this is the good part of it is now we get to live. This is a time where we're living in that victory of, of, of Easter, of the promises that were fulfilled when he raised from the dead. And so um, when he conquered death. And so he spent 40 additional days once he was resurrected. He spent 40 additional days here on earth. And he allowed his life to be really a, the power and the um, they allowed, he allowed his life to be um, a reflection and a testimony of his power and his resurrection. I love, um, and this is kind of, do you guys ever like to brag on people? I kind of like to brag on people. I also am kind of like a trash talker, like when we're playing games and stuff. I don't, I don't have brothers. Um, I don't know where it is, but instinctually I just like to talk when we're in a game. 
Even if I know I have no chance of winning, I'm going to talk like I have all chance of winning. And then when I just think things are great, I really just like to talk about people, not like talk about people, but I just like to be like, hey, did you see what so-and-so, it just brings me joy. And so this is kind of, um, as I was studying, just a random thing for us to think about. Um, John chapter 20, verse 25, it says, um, it's, it's kind of finishing up the chapter of John, and it says, And there are also many other things that Jesus did, which if they were written one by one, I suppose that the, even the world itself could not contain the books that would be written. Amen. I just think that's so powerful because it testifies of when we read the Bible, it's just a portion, a portion of what Jesus did. And the, the, the hope and the... Um, the power that that in enables me, that the things that stir me up is that's my heavenly father. That's who I serve. That's who is on my side. That he is so miraculous that he do, had did so many things. And later we read that it says that, he, or, it, or maybe before, kind of depending on where you're reading in the gospels, that he wants us to do even greater things than that. And so there's just so much hope that, he, that, I, that I think that he has for me and that he has for you. Um, but okay, so anyways, that's just me bragging on Jesus just a little bit, that there was so much of what he did that we couldn't even, there's not enough books to contain it. So we're going to have you turn to Matthew chapter 28. Matthew chapter 28. For those of you that are, I don't want to assume that we're all on the same page or that we all know the same thing. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John are called the Gospels. And they all are, are testimonies. They testify of God's, of Jesus' time here on earth. And it's from their viewpoint. And so we're going to go to the Gospel of Mark. It's the first chapter in the New Testament. And we're going to go towards the end. Matthew chapter 28. Matthew 28, verse 16. It says, Then the eleven disciples went uh, away into Galilee to the mountains which Jesus had appointed for them. When they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. And Jesus, say, Jesus came and spoke to them, saying, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. All authority. So this is Jesus has raised from the dead, and he's saying, Hey, look it. All authority, I've conquered it all. It's all been given to me, all of it. In heaven and in earth, authority belongs to me. And he's beginning to testify about his power and his authority. But there's a reason why. Has any, has any, the, the worst questions for me are, what are you doing tonight? Because I'm like, what, what do you want of me? Just, so it's kind of like that thing, like if I get a text, what are you doing tonight? I sometimes don't answer what I'm doing in... in um, a little bit of apprehension to what you might ask. So uh, uh, just just tell me what you want. I just, you know, don't butter me up. Just be like, hey, can you fill in the blank? Are you free to go to lunch? Do you want to go to coffee? Don't set me up. What are you doing today? Because I don't know, like, you may tell me something and I may get super busy. Or you may tell me something and I, I may be super busy and clear everything off. Like, who knows? You know, like, you just don't know. Um, so anyways, so he's kind of buttering them up here a little bit. He's saying, hey, look it, all authority in heaven and earth have been given to me. And then he lays it down. And then he says, go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you. And to, and lo, excuse me, I am with you always, ever or even, excuse me, to the end of the age. See, we're reading here about his presence, his abiding presence, as Pastor Jay has been talking about. So he's saying, hey, look, all authority has been given to me. And now that you know this, what I want you to do is to go into all the nations and make disciples. I want you to go not just to make disciples, but I want you to go baptize them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And then know that as you go, I am going with you even to the end of the age. So he has this promise. He's giving them instruction and he's giving them promise. And so like I said, we were talk we've been talking about his presence. And so he's saying, I'm going to go with you always. But at the end of this, he begins, at the end of his time, he begins to give them specific instruction. As you read in the Gospels, he gives them instruction, right? I want you to stay in Jerusalem until, until the helper comes. There's, there's someone who is coming. He gives them instruction at the end of his, of his life. But at the beginning of his life, he gives the people an invitation, and so we're going to look at that invitation, and that invitation has a little bit to do, or a lot to do, with you and I. As I said, we serve a God who is a sovereign God, who loves us, who actually gives us the free will to choose him. 
You know, I know when, when Jay chose me, I felt like the luckiest girl in the world. When he finally just said, hey, like, well, we were young. I'll just leave it at that. Um, and, you know, we were silly. He did some silly things. But when he finally said, I choose you, I thought, oh, my goodness, that handsome boy from Wisconsin with those big blue eyes and those, like, that charming smile chose me. Like, it was just so, like, ha. Ah. Well, Jesus is saying, I want you to choose me. Because when you choose me, you'll realize that I've always chosen you and it's always been you. Isn't that great? Oh, anyways, I just love love. And because God is love, how can you not love him? All right, so Luke chapter, chapter 4, we're going to go. And in Luke, um, Luke is actually a physician. And so his writings are a little different than the other gospels. But here Jesus, in the beginning of, of Luke chapter 4, he's ministering. He's talking about who he is. He is, um, from there, he's casting out unclean spirits. And um, he, he heals again. And we're going to pick up in verse 20, 42. It says, now when it was day, he departed. And he went into a deserted place. And the crowd sought him and came to him and tried to keep him from leaving them. But he said to them, I must preach the kingdom of God to the other cities also, because for this purpose I have been sent. And he was preaching in the synagogues of Galilee. So here Jesus is, and they're wanting to keep him. They're wanting, they're saying, teach us more, teach us more. And he's like, nope, I'm on mission. I'm headed somewhere. I, I'm, I'm going. So now we pick up in chapter, um, chapter 5. But before we go there, chapter 5, verse 16, it actually also says, so he himself often re withdrew into the wilderness and prayed. So we read in chapter 4, verse 42, that he, was, he went into a deserted place, right? So we see he's trying to get away, and they find him. And then later we read again that it says that he often withdrew and prayed. See, Jesus was intentional about his time with his heavenly father. He didn't just ride on the fact that he was the son of God. He didn't just ride on the fact that he was a chosen one. He didn't ride just on the fact that he could perform miracles. He was intentional about his relationship with his heavenly father. Because we read that he says, I only do what the father tells me to do. I only say what the father tells me to say. Well, how did he know those things? Because he spent time with him. He often withdrew. See, when we're, when we're talking about this, he didn't allow success, fame, results. He didn't even let his calling get in the way with spending time with his father. See, we got to recognize this because we can't just rest on if it's God's will, it will happen. No, the son of God often withdrew. He spent time with him. He didn't cave to the pressures or the expectations of man. He didn't cave. He didn't make the compromises. He was on mission, and he was intentional. I love when I get good feedback. And so here they are. They're saying, stay, stay. We want you. We need you. And he's saying, nope. I, I got to go preach the kingdom. I, I'm headed somewhere. See, he was trying to get away. Not because he didn't like people, but because he recognized the importance of spending time with his heavenly father. See, this whole idea of giving God a year is we could either just say, yeah, I'll read my Bible when I can. Or, yeah, that's like system. And, like, why are you telling me what to do? Or, like, I, I want to read my own reading plan. Or I don't need to read, you know, pray every day. You could criticize it all you want. We're just saying, hey, in this house, for this season, this is the direction God's taking us. He's calling all of us. There is no exception or exemption. If you're part of this body, he's saying, come join and let's be intentional and see what I can do. Because we recognize that when Jesus was intentional, we see things happen. We're going to read into that just a little bit. So we're going to continue on to Luke chapter 5, and we'll begin with verse 1. So it was as a multitude pressed him about him. I just think that's crazy. Just when I think about it and I read about like things where they talk about multitudes, or when they were trying to like kill him and they're carrying him over. I just, I kind of try to visualize what that's like. And that just seems like stressful and, oh, give me some, I, I mean, I, I, personal space is always optional for me. But like in the movie theater, I don't like to sit by anyone I don't know. 
So I will look for the, if Jay is in a seat and there's no one next to him and there's someone next to me in my seat, I will get up and switch with him. And just, it's just this weird thing. That's like the one place my personal space matters is in a movie theater. That's so random. We went to a movie and I like looked and I had someone next to me and then the first thing I did, I looked down. I was like, oh, Jay has someone next to him. I can't switch. Um, so anyways, um, so anyway, so they pressed about him to hear the word of God that he stood by. Oh, okay, I'm going to start over again. So it was as the multitude pressed about him to hear the word of God that he stood by the lake of Gennesaret, Gennesaret and saw two boats standing by the lake. But the fishermen had gone from them and were washing their nets. Then he got into one of the boats, with si which was Simon's, and asked him to put it a little from the land. And he sat down and taught the multitudes from the boat. Okay, so let me just think about this really fast. So fishermen fished at night generally. So it's early in the morning. There's already a crowd of people who are coming towards him. There's two boats there, and Jesus looks, and he decides, I'm just going to get in this boat. So he gets into the boat, and the owner of the boat, which is Simon Peter, gets in with him. And Jesus tells him, uh, just Take me a little away from the land, please. And then he preaches from a boat, or he teaches from a boat. I just, I, again, when I read this, it, you could just read it and not think about this, but there is something kind of miraculous in all of that. Like, he didn't have a PA system. He might have been using, like, the sound waves off the water. Um, but just if you read it for what it is, how did the multitude of people hear him? So here he is. Um, and he just used what he had. Well, it wasn't actually even his. He just used what he saw. There was nothing significant to it. It was a fisherman's boat. I think it was probably stinky because fish stink, I would assume, right? Like, they're, it's not they're, like, pulling out their, like, 409 to clean it every day. It, it's probably a, kind of a stinky place. And, and Simon is just like, sure, yeah, okay. He, like, you know, rows them out or however they get out there. And then he teaches. Now, this is where it begins to, if this wasn't already just a little bit baffling, this is where things begin to get really interesting for me. It says in verse 4, when he stopped speaking, he said to Simon, launch out, launch out into the deep and let down your nets for a catch. Verse 5, but Simon answered and said to him, Master, we have toiled all night and caught nothing. Nevertheless, at your word, I will let down your nets. Have you ever grumbled and complained when the Lord asked you to do something that you've already done? Have you ever said something, and, and this could just be me, because I was just writing down things that I, I've maybe said, or I've maybe heard people say before, oh, I've been, re I've, I've been obedient, I, I don't, I, and I got no results, so I don't know. Or I prayed for someone, and God didn't heal them, so I, I, I don't know, like I don't even know if he heals. I mean, I read my Bible, but I, I don't ever hear him speak to me. We have, like I said, we have interns that we work with, and um, one of the fun phrases that I, they'll often say is, I read, one, one of them said, I read until I find a scripture that sticks out to me and then I stop. <laughs> oh, I kind of laughed. I said, are you serious? And she, <laughs> the person said yes. Um, it's okay. We're all in training. We're all a work in progress. It just made me chuckle. Um, I've tried to spend time with him, but I, I don't ever feel his presence. Or I've invited this person before, or I've done this, I've done that, and I've got no results. Anyone there with me? Yeah, and so here, here is here's Simon Peter who's like, um, I've already done what you're asking me to do, and I got nothing. But nevertheless, at your word, nevertheless, at your word, I will let down the net. See, something happens when we just decide I'm just going to take him at his word despite what seems to have not happened in the past. Something happens when we just decide in our heart, God, at your word, my circumstances don't dictate who you are. I don't know why that person was or wasn't healed, were, weren't free. That's not my place to judge, but I'm going to just still step out and pray for that person because your word says you heal. I don't have much money in my pocket, but because you're asking me to give, I'm going to give. Because nevertheless, at your word, I will launch my net. And what begins to happen 
is something very miraculous. See, at his word, we are asking you to trust us as pastors to say, give God a year and watch what happens. You can look at the back of this, and, and we have just some ideas. We say, join Operation Solid Lives. Well, I already know stuff. Okay. Get involved in Chapel Valley Ministry. Well, I don't really have time. I mean, I have Okay. Participate in the Solid, uh, Solid Life Reading Journal Plan. Well, I have my own journal that I like to read and my own reading plan. I'm doing this. Okay. Regular attend Chapel Valley services. Well, you know, sometimes I, I just, Sunday mornings are really family time for me. I get it, but okay. Pray 10 minutes a day. Well, I, I just, you know, my life gets really busy and I get up really early or I'm up, okay. Or we can just say, at your word, Lord, because this is the community you have me in, I'm going to launch my net and I'm going to see what happens. See, give God a year is about taking God at his word we believe, we believe 100% that he's asking us to cast our nets in a way that we've done before. Did you hear me? He's asking us to cast our nets in a way that we've done before, in avenues, in ways that we've done before. And I believe just as I read what's about to happen, he wants to do in and through each one of us. So verse 6, it says, And when he had done this, they caught a great number of fish, and their nets began to break. Their nets were break, and the net and their net was breaking. So they signaled to the, the partners in the other boats to come and help them. And they came and they filled both boats so that they began to sink. So now we go from, hey, I've already done this, to, but at your word, I'm gonna do this. And it's so much to an overflowing and unexpected result. See, when Peter got, or when Simon Peter got into the boat, he wasn't getting into the boat with hopes that he would catch fish. He just was getting in the boat because Jesus asked him, hey, can you take me out in your boat? He wasn't just going, he wasn't expecting something extravagant to happen, right? At this point, there's not even an expectation that he's going to get fish. But at a seemingly simple request, God begins to do the impossible, but it was only once someone made room for him to use what he had. See, it was only that when Simon said, okay, let's go. Take what's mine. I'm going to make room for you. And as he made room for him, simply creating space for Jesus, Simon experienced the miraculous. I got to believe that as we begin to make room for him in our lives, in the simplicity, 10 minutes a day does not seem like very much time. But as we begin to do in the simplicity and walk in obedience to what um, just the, the church body he has for you, that we don't go and approach, okay, God, now I'm going to need lots of fish. No, nope, that as we make room in the simplicity, he'll begin to do the miraculous in and through us. And who needs a little miraculous in their life? Who needs miraculous things to happen in their city? Who, and I, I mean, I don't really follow politics a whole bunch, but we know that we need, we need not the, well, we need probably the miraculous to happen politically. But what, but what we seem to not be really in control of is the way things are going. And so what we need to begin to have a handle on isn't to shift necessarily the way the, the, the politics are going. What we need to have a handle on is how the Lord is moving in and through us. So despite how the politics, despite how things are happening here, we work and operate in an environment that is not like everyone else's. And then we begin to see, because we're going to read what happens when God does the miraculous, that people respond and he is glorified. See, we, we, are, not, we are not in control of what's happening around us. You know, there's sometimes that I feel like just on a small scale of my, my family's life, my, the five of us, there's some days that I am like, who is running this place? What is happening? Like my, uh, oh, okay, I'm just going to go for it, I should ask, but my sweet boy, my firstborn, I love all of my children, but my sweet oldest boy, who really does have a sweetheart, I had bought him some jeans for Easter, and um, we're, we're trying to figure out his size. He doesn't really like jeans, so I don't, I don't really push it. So I, I hand him, and I said, hey, um, can you try on these jeans for me? And he had, he had an audience of a few people. 
I'm not even joking. I hand him the jeans. He looks at me and he goes, no, and walks away. Oh, I had to pause. <laughs> oh, I had to pause. And I just said, go upstairs into the bathroom. And he knew exactly what that meant. And I took my time going up those sweet stairs because I am like, Lord, help me. Help me right now. What is happening? What is happening that he just in him thinks I can blatantly disrespect you in front of everyone and drop the jeans and walk away? Who is running the show? I thought I was doing good, but sometimes you ever feel that way? Oh, and it's in front of people that we're like discipling and like the, the, our disciples, they do life with life with us. So it's not like they see the good, the bad and the ugly. So it's not like I'm trying to like have this facade, but just sometimes you feel like what is happening here? Yeah, and, and that's how the world is going at like a larger scale. And what we need is to just have God's perspective and lens to bring us back in and say, all right, but this is what I'm doing. All right, so, so as we begin to make room for God, we'll see the miraculous. And then verse 8. When Simon Peter saw it, he fell down at Jesus' knees, and, and he set his knees saying, Depart from me, for I am a sinful man. Oh, do you ever recognize or think, you know, what I love about God is that he, he gives us those deep desires, not like the wants, but those deep things, those dreams that maybe you've seen have faded away those hopes that seem to have died, and you begin to look and say, I am disqualified. You're calling me? And here Peter, or Simon Peter says, I'm a sinful man. Like, leave out of my presence because he understands that, like, you, like, as a rabbi, should not be in my presence. And, like, all of this just seems so wrong. Do you know who I am? And here's the thing. Jesus knew exactly who he was inviting, and yet he never touches on it. He never touches it. He just goes to verse 9. It says, for he, and this is where, it, this is where we want to get the handle, for he and all who were with him were astonished at the catch of fish when they had been taken. And so also were um, James and John, the, Johns of Zebed, or the sons of Jeb, Zebedee, who were partners with Simon. And Jesus said to Simon, do not be afraid. From now on, you will catch men. See, when we walk in obedience and, and we give room for God to move, he begins to get glory and testify, and people begin to see the miraculous happen. See, as Simon walked in obedience, and he had to call out his partners, and then the fishes were coming in, and boats are sinking. I just think it's like chaos, not like, oh, and the boats were sinking. And, you know, they're, this is their livelihood. And they're like, they're going down while things are coming in. And I just, I don't know, I just see all of this stuff. And there's like still, let's not even forget, there's still people who are out there, right, who are just all oh, witnessing this and so he just comes and says to them oh don't be afraid I, I know who you are and guess what I'm going to make you fishers of men stick with me and I'm going to do what I've called and created and designed for you to do come walk with me don't get caught up on that because he wasn't caught up on it Stick with me. Give God a year of saying, hey, stick with us. It's going to be, we might be have boats that are like filling up with fish, and it may look like we don't know what we're doing. And you may be like, what has the Lord asked of me? And we're just saying, stick with us. Give us, don't give us a year, but you're, if you're with us, it's us. But give God a year in this time frame and begin to see him do the miraculous. But here's the thing. If you come and say, okay, I'll give God a year, and you never have any expectation, a year from now, your life will look the same. See, what's dependent on, you could either say, I've done all that before, and it hasn't worked out, or you can say, I've done all that before, but at your word, I'm going to cast these nets, and I'm going to begin to see him move. I'm going to begin to see him fill up the boats of my life with fish. I'm going to begin to see things happen and overflowing. And it might just be as simple as leading people to the Lord, which is the greatest thing. It may be the financial breakthrough that you need. I don't know. It could just be that your marriage, you and your husband talk. I don't know. 
I, I don't know where you are in the midst of this. I don't know where you are in the journey of this. I don't know where you need to be stretched, where he wants to say, hey, you've been operating in a way that makes you feel, you operate in the way that you're disqualified, but I want you to operate in a way that I've qualified you, that I've called you, that I have a plan for you. See, we keep repeating it over and over and over. You know why? Because in, in the Gospels, we read that it says that the harvest is plentiful, but the labors are few. See, Jesus isn't saying the issue is with the people coming to him. The issue is that we don't have people to go get him. Well, there is 1.6 billion people who have not ever heard the gospel. 1.6 billion who've never heard that don't have the gospel accessible to them. Now, Let's not, that's just 1.6 unreached people, billion. That's not to mention the people who are currently on a path that are believing false gods, who are serving, who are in, who are in cults, who are in bondage, who are believing lies every day. See, it says the harvest is plentiful, but the labors are few. What I find so amazing about this is Peter says, hey, look, I'm a sinner, so you need to go. And Jesus says, I know who you are, but don't worry. I'm actually going to make you a fisher of men. And then this is the, I mean, this is all really good. But this is where it's like you, just, you should drop the mic and be done. <laughs> Verse 11 says, so when they had brought back their boats to land, they forsook it all and followed him. In other gospels, it said they left everything there and followed him. They didn't cash in the goods because that was their livelihood and there was boats full. They left, they didn't try to get a good deal on their boats to like help fund the ministry. No, they forsook everything and followed him. Everything. See, when we begin to experience Christ, we begin to have a lens of what's important. We begin to say, oh, I can pray for 20 minutes a day. Oh, I, I can do this for an hour. Now, an hour is long. I, I've done it where I've set my timer before, and I'm like, oh, I'm doing good. And I look, and it's like 15 minutes. <laughs> I'm like, woo! Woo! <laughs> I thought we were like pounding through things, Lord. No, got 45 minutes to go. Okay, here you know. And he's just saying, honey, just come spend time with me. Don't begin, you know, the reason that we, we, we put stuff as what give God a year is because we want to be intentional in one sense. We don't want to just be like, hey, we're calling you to give God a year. We don't really know what that means. No, we believe that he showed us a few ways, a few keys that are the starting point, that are the launching points. See, the launching point for Simon was when he got in the boat and he went out. It was when he just said, here we go. The other starting point was when he said, launch the net. See, he gave him things to do. And then he met him right where he was. I believe that the Lord is saying that he, he wants to meet you right where you are. He knows your disqualifications. He knows your fears. He knows where you're bound. And none of that intimidates him. He knows the things you struggle with. That doesn't bother him. He knows the church body that he's brought you to. <laughs> Which I always think is, I just think it's funny. I, I just, I, yeah. I, I, not that I think the church body is funny. I think that Jay and I are kind of like an interesting bunch when you really look at us. Because we just, we just love the Lord and we believe him at his word. And so we don't really think too much too long about ourselves. Well, you know. But he's just saying, I know who you are. I know your name. I know the numbers of hair that you do or don't have on your head. Or on your beard. Or wherever. He knows. And what I love, he's saying, all right, so come follow me. Don't be afraid. See, he, he prefaces it with saying, don't be afraid. Because it's actually going to take you courage to say, here I am. It's actually going to take you to step out in faith and say, okay, here I am. All right, I, I get that I've done this before. I get that this sounds familiar, but I'm going to take you at your word. Amen? Oh, this is good. All right. So he's saying, don't be afraid. Stick with me. I'm going to 
I'm going to do in you what I have set forth to do in you. If you're here, I don't care what, what you're struggling with or with disbelief or not. He's saying what I have set for you, I want to do. But it's up to you to come follow me. So they experience him and then they leave everything. They leave all that's what's important. And so um, if that isn't enough, you know, we're going we're gonna to go. Um, I, I decided to go. I like to read, like I, I'll read different versions. or the different, uh, the different gospels have just the wording's a little different. So for this, we're going to turn to Mark. So Matthew, Mark. Mar uh, Mark chapter 2. Mark chapter 2, verse, um, we're going to start with verse 1, and we're going to go to, uh, we'll start in verse 1. And again he entered Capernaum after some days, and it was heard that he was in, a, in the house. Immediately many gathered together, so that there was no longer room to receive them, not even near the door, and he preached the word. So here he is, he comes, and he's in this house, which houses are not like our house size, the house structure was different. But they're all packed in there. And not only are they packed in there, but they're around it so no one can even get to the door. Okay, so you guys have this picture. This place is like packed. All right, so there, it's packed in there. Verse 3, then they, it's just they, these people, come, came to him, bringing a paralytic who was carried by four men. Again, so here's a man, he can't walk, and he's being carried by four men. So this man that's, that is injured, that is, is maimed, we don't know how he became paralyzed, he's being carried by four people. So this man is not on his journey alone. And when they could not get near him because of the crowd, this is where I, I just think is really awesome, they uncovered the roof where he was. Now, you may have heard this story before, but just bear with me like this is the first time you've ever heard it. So they uncovered the roof where he was. So when they had broken through, they, laid, they, let them, they let down the bed on which the paralytic was laying. So here they are, are these groups, there's a group of people. They're walking, they're, they have the faith. They have the, they have the, the vision. They, they have it for this man who's, who's not walking. So much so that they're carrying him actually on a bed because it says that later, it says that they, laid, they lowered him down on a bed. So there's four men carrying a paralytic man on a bed, on a journey. And so they approach it and they think, okay, so Jesus, who can heal that, him, the very reason we're here is not accessible to me. I don't quite know how to get to him. Have you ever felt that way? I don't quite know how to, I just, I'm just, I'm sitting and I don't know quite how to hear what's happening or get the right perspective. Well, let's just note, this man was not alone. So these four men come together. One of them, right, thinks, let's get it on the roof. I just, I, again, as I look at this and I think about how crazy this sounds. So they're up there and I'm thinking, I, I didn't really like look to read like what houses were made of, but in my mind frame, I'm thinking they're like tearing off the shingles, right? And they're like, as they're tearing off the shingles, then they're taking off like the board, I think that's under the shingles. And now they're like breaking the roof. So just think, so people are, it's like we're here preaching, everything's great. And now we're just hearing this like pounding and this commotion on this roof. And all of a sudden, down comes a man on a bed, on a bed not lowered on a rope. He is fully on a bed. How did he even get on the roof with the bed? Like, you know, like, do, are two of them like carrying or he's like tied around the bed and they're lifting it up and like, who knows what is happening? But they, they, they literally trash this house to get to the savior, to get to the healer. And all four of those people understood the severity of this man's condition. All four of these people, he was not in it alone. The, the, he recognized, he was vulnerable. And they're saying, hey man, we're in this with you. We were in this together. We're gonna go to great lengths so that you experience the healing for yourself. Because there was no gain for them, right? They weren't going for healing for themselves. They're going for healing on the behalf of someone else. And they weren't going to just stop and like, oh, well, 
guess we can't get in. We'll, we'll just have to try another day. No, they're like, man, you're going to get this healing. You're going to get this breakthrough. If it's the last thing we do, we're going to get on the roof. We'll be right back. And can you imagine the man just laid on the bed? Like, what is happening? Yeah, we got you, man. And they're like climbing up there, it's, you know, throwing things off. Now, again, the house is surrounded by people. What are people thinking or doing? Maybe they're helping up. Who knows? There's all these details that he just lets you fill in for yourself. He's just, he's just, he's good. But they wanted, they knew, they were longing for the breakthrough, and they weren't in it alone. See, it took, the, it took them together to, to usher in, to, to get him to the healer, that only the healer could do what he could do. See, giving God a year isn't this journey that you're on it alone. You could choose to live in isolation when people... Again, like I said, don't text me like, what are you doing? If you need prayer, just tell me what you need prayer for. Don't do this. There, there's something that's just private. Well, okay. I, I don't know how to pray. I think I've said this before. Our, our sweet little boy, Lawrence, who's at, in the military, you know, he always says, oh, how can I pray for you? Oh, just pray how you want. Boy, you don't want me praying for you how I want because you will end up in pulpit ministry right next to me. And since we know you're currently fighting that, you better give me something to pray for. Because right now I'm praying you straight into God's will that I know he has for your life. So if you have a prayer request, these men, this man wasn't in it alone. He, he wasn't, he was, he was walking. Just think about the conversation. They walk up and they see everything is packed. Could you imagine the processing that was happening? Do you think it's going to happen? Oh, only Jesus can heal me. I know he can heal me. All right, we're in this together. See, we're, we're called to live life together, not in isolation. See, giving God a year saying we're in this together. We're working what? We're working towards more together. Because we are, we are, when we are not functioning as the body, when we want to be private, when we want to be isolated, we're not functioning as we ought to be functioning. Could you imagine if just one of those people would have been like, yeah, I, I, don't, I don't believe it. No, he, all four of them were at it. All four of them were going towards the promise of God for one man. See, God wants to do this together. And it causes us to be vulnerable. It causes us to be exposed. I don't know what, just think about it. That man's laying in a bed. What is he wearing? He was exposed. He was vulnerable and he was at the mercy of people. There was nothing he could do. And then, but there were a trusted group that said, we got you, man. We're going, we're going for this. There's people who are in our life that, that tell Jay and I, we're going for, they don't even live here, but they're like, we're going for this. We're going for that church building. We're going for the city of Fitchburg. We're, go, we're going at it with you. So you keep pressing on. Hey, we're going to keep praying with you. We got you. We're going to be dragging you sometimes because sometimes you just need people to drag you. Let's be real. There are times that we are just exhausted, we've done, and we're just like, Lord, help me. And you have that person, all right, we got you. I, I got, I'm, I'm going to pull you right now, so don't mind me. And they're pulling us or they're pushing us and they're reminding of God's promises. We're not intended to live, live this alone. And see what happens in verse 5. It says, when Jesus saw, not his faith, when Jesus saw their faith, their faith. If you have your Bible circle, their faith. He said to the paralytic, son, your sins are forgiven. See, and then, and then it goes on, and the scribes and the people, they're all upset because they're like, who are you to be giving forgiveness? Who are you to be healing people? Verse 7, it says, why does this man speak blasphemies like this? Who can forgive sins but God alone? The interesting thing was that they were all sitting and they're listening to his teaching. So I, I, don't, I don't know. I heard T.D. Jakes one day say, I don't know what you heard today. I preached a message, but I don't know what you heard. I, I'm preaching a message right now. I don't even know what you're hearing. I don't know where you're at. I don't know the things you're struggling with. Clearly, those people were in the presence of God. Who knows what they were hearing? Clearly not the truth because they were like, who are you? So, um, but immediately, verse 8, when Jesus perceived in his spirit that they were, they had reasoned thus within themselves, he said to them, why, does, why do you reason about these things in your hearts? Which is easier to say to the paralytic, your sins are forgiven? Or, oh, he's so good. 
Which is easier to say, your sins are forgiven, or to say, arise, take your bed and walk. See, Jesus didn't care what people thought. And then he goes, but that you may know the Son of Man has power on earth to forgive to sins. And he says to the paralytic, I say to you, arise, take your bed, not your mat, but maybe it could have been a mat, but still, take your bed and go to your house. Immediately he rose, took the bed, and he went into the presence of them all. And so they were all amazed and glorified God, saying, we never saw anything like this. See, we need break. We all need breakthrough. Where I am with my relationship with God, I can't stay here. I don't want to stay here. There is so much more. I need breakthrough. I need a shift. I need someone to come with me and tear the roof down and say, get me into his presence, please. See, you guys need breakthrough in your life or you can stay where you're at. But here's the thing is you actually never stay where you're at. Things are either moving forward or they're regressing backwards. See, the enemy think, likes us to think we're just in this neutral zone. There is no neutral zone, period. There's no neutral zone in your relationships, in your marriage, with your children. There is most definitely no neutral zone with God. You're either moving forward towards him or you're regressing backwards. You can be like the scribe and say, but who are they to ask us to give of our time? And I'm going to say, well, the Lord's calling us to tell people to rise up and walk. So you're either going to come with us and you're going to walk and you're going to grow in the faith and you're going to begin to see who God's called you to be and you're going to push out your net, you're going to push out your boat and your net or you're going to say, who are they? But I'm telling you, Jay and I are committed to this city. We are committed to this congregation that God would do all that he said that he would do to you and in his word. But you can't do business as usual. See, he will be glorified the moment we make room for him. The moment we make room for him. The moment we make room the moment we stop giving ourselves the excuses, the moment we stop saying, you know, I, 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 uh, the interns in our, uh, our discipleship process, I, I love it because it teaches, it teaches me quite a bit. It's like parenting. You just, you don't know until you've been there. And so there'll be times people have told me, oh, well, you know, but, but, but Jay said, and I'll, I, or my kids will do this, but dad said, and I'll just say, but I just told you to do this. <laughs> and it's not that my word trumps his word, it's just in this situation, this what is what needs to happen. See, in this situation right now, this is what needs to happen. In this situation right now, he's calling you and say, use what you got. That's all he wants. If you look in both of these situations, they use what they had. They transported the man, not on a camel, not on a, you know, this like elaborate thing. They carried him. They used their shoulders. They used their arms, they used their feet, they used what they had. Simon, what did he use? His boat. He didn't have time to make it fancy or clean, he just used it. See, God is just saying, come as you are. I want to use you as you are. I want to speak to you as you are because you will not stay where you're at once you come into my presence. You won't stay with what you have to use for very long. Because they went out on a boat with nothing and came back with two bolts of a whole bunch of something. He went, to, he went to go meet him on a bed, and he was carrying that bed back to where he was going and saying, praise the Lord, I have been healed. You guys, you've got to catch this. The enemy wants us to just be okay with where we're at. He doesn't need to attack your marriage. He doesn't need to attack you. If he can just have you in neutral, you'll do it for yourself. See, give God a year is about saying, all right, God, all that I have is yours. First Corinthians, so like I said, we do, we do a reading plan. Um, and it's called the Solid Life Reading Plan. You can get it on your phone and, and other ways. But we were in our reading plan, and um, we read, I think it was Friday night. Um, First Corinthians chapter 3. I think I put 13. I'm sorry. It's chapter 3, because there, unless you caught that. Oh, sorry. All right. So um, 1 Corinthians chapter 3, it says, verse 5, Who then is Paul, and who is Apollos, but ministers through whom you believed, as the Lord gave to each one? And then it goes on to say, I planted, Apollos watered, but God gave increase. 
So neither he who plants is anything, nor he who waters, but God who gives the increase. See, we have a responsibility. It says one person planted, one person watered, but who gave the increase? Oh, come on. Who gave the increase? God. See, this is what he's saying. He's saying, you do your part, you do your part, and then watch me move. Because actually all of this is not possible unless I'm actually the one doing it. All of this is just stuff. Unless you say, okay, God, I'm coming for the increase of you. You have your way. You do it. You teach me how to pray. You show me how to pray. You give me the words how to pray. You increase my spiritual language. Here at Chapel Valley, we believe in speaking in tongues, period. We believe that that is how when we pray, that is the way that you're praying, the perfect will of God. When I don't know what to do, it is not freaky or weird. It is what it is. I go and I begin to pray in my heavenly language. I begin to just, it, it builds me up. Uh, Mary, she, she's like a grandmother to our children. She always used to tell our kids, it's powering up. It's powering up. Have you powered up today? Because it just, it, your spirit begins to come alive. And your flesh that wants to run everything begins to diminish. We read that when John, right, John was the precursor to Jesus. What does he say? I must decrease so that Jesus, that he himself can increase. See, the only way that God's going to increase is if we begin begin to decrease and our flesh begins to come in alignment when we begin to pray in the spirit when we begin to get powered up our flesh begins to diminish its its desires its wants all of those things that we've given it room to do begin to diminish because what's happening God is increasing in our life see this whole God give God a year is about saying all right I'm gonna water I'm gonna plow I'm gonna do this but who gives the increase God gives the increase no one of us in here who garden would ever think about planting seed right now in the current state of your garden bed, right? I mean, I might. I might be like, hey, I'll just put a hole here. Jay does all the sowing. And then no one person here once planted the seed would just say, see you in July, right? No, you're after those weeds. I always talk about the weeds that look like they're pretty plants, but they're just like there to suck and kill and take up all the roots of things. So why would we do that with our relationship with the Lord? Why would we wait for Sunday to Sunday? There are some weeks that we survive Sunday to Sunday. Absolutely. There are some days that weeks that we are just, we feel that the reality of things is, is so much truer than the word of God. But he's saying, don't just, just, don't just leave it Sunday to Sunday. This is about being intentional every single day. It is about us learning to contend and to pursue and to surrender everything to be followers of Christ. Because in the end, he is always faithful. I'm going to say that again. In the end, he is always faithful. If you don't believe it, begin to get scripture that's coming in and out of your mouth that says you are faithful. You are faithful. Why do we sing these songs to God? Because it's who he is. When we begin to get the word of God out of our mouth, OSL, they give us scripture. Why? Because we don't get to combat the enemy with our fun thoughts or our really sassy words. I can give you some sassy words, but that's not going to do anything. It's when I begin to say, no, but the word of God says, by your stripes, I've been healed. And so, God, I thank you that as we are feeling like we are not getting anywhere with this sickness, Lord, you have already done and paid for it. I've already been healed, so I will stand up, and I will keep saying, by your stripes I'm healed. God, I thank you that by your stripes I am healed. God, I thank you that there's no weapon formed against our house that's going to prosper. God, I thank you that it says to train up my children now, and they will not depart in it. So as he is dropping his pants, God, I thank you this is his training ground. He is in training and then when he gets older, he's going to be all yours. So God, strengthen me. Give me your perspective to see as you sing. Begins, and what are we doing? We're building ourselves up. Oh, I don't know what to say. I am completely frustrated with my husband or my children. I'm just going to go pray in the spirit. There was a couple that I knew that said they would never, they had just come to a place that when they would fight, they wouldn't argue about it. They would just go pray in the spirit. And then they would come back. They would go begin to, I, I've, I've yet to practice that. <laughs> this person told me this a long time ago. That's probably a little bit of a surrender I got to do to not be right, you know, in the situation. But I'm just going to just quick, I'm going to power up. 
I'm going to begin to declare the things that he's saying to me. I'm going to begin to get those things in and out of my mouth. I believe that he is, the, the season he's calling to us is actually quite simple. It's not complicated. And it's the same way that he called his disciples. He came, he spoke, they heard, and then they responded. I believe he's saying, come, hear my sayings, my teachings, my words daily through my word. Use what you have to bring my presence to his people. Continue to be obedient to the small nudgings. Could you imagine if the four guys would have just said, the circumstances in front of us are showing us now's not the time. Nope, we're going to go for it. Simon, oh, I've, I've been all, all night. Can you use someone else's boat? I mean, I'm sure there was two. He could have. But he said, okay, here we go. And he wants us as we spend time with him, as we learn to talk to him. You know, um, last night my daughter was having a, just a hard time. She began missing someone. Um, she began missing my, so my mother-in-law's mom, who she had only met a few years. All of a sudden she was like overwhelmed with grief. Like she just started crying and, and started saying, gosh, I miss grandma. And I'm so sad that I'm not going to, I'm, I'm not going to, you know, I didn't really know her. And she, I don't know, you know, where did this come from? She just all of a sudden was had grief in her heart. And every part of me wanted to be like, but honey, you have all these special people. I just wanted to, like, fix it. And so I just said, no, honey, you know what, what we do when, we're, when I'm sad is I press into God, and I begin to say, oh, God, I'm hurting. I don't understand this. And so I b had this moment with her that just said, okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pray, and I want you to say these words. And so she began crying, and she's just saying, God, I'm so sad that I didn't know my grandma. This hurts. And then I said, let's begin to ask the Holy Spirit for comfort, because he's the comforter. So she just said, Holy Spirit, will you come bring me peace? And all of a sudden, as a faithful God, there just became peace. It, just, it settled. It stopped. But we had to press into the pain. We had to press in to the reality to get to the truth that said, but God, you have your Holy Spirit who's my comforter. And we just had this moment. It was, I was exhausted. I mean, it was like 9.45. I'd driven all day. But there was this moment, and that's what the Lord is saying. Just press in as you are. Press into my promises. Come. I know. He never wants us to feel... The enemy is one that brings that shame and guilt and disqualification, not the Lord, never the Lord. But he wants us to learn to press into him in those moments that will be uncomfortable, that will be awkward, that we don't really know to get more of him. And he's saying, follow me and watch me do the increase in your life and around those who are around you.